in my previous video, I tried to explain how the density, space-time itself has a density. And that density is maintained constant by the expansion of the universe. Now I want to look at the possibility that maybe the density of space-time is constant, but it's not uniform. And the difference in the density affects how matter and energy interact with each other and interact with space-time itself. Now, prior I explained that matter was formed by axions and energy coming together in the early stages of the universe. Because of that, axions have an affinity for matter and they tend to clump around matter. So whenever there are large masses like planets, stars, and galaxies, these entities become the gathering place for these actions. Now, they are invisible, but their effect is noticeable. And one place where it's noticed is at the extreme, and the extreme in terms of the universe is the black hole. Now, black holes are formed in different ways, but they all have one thing in common. They are formed whenever large stars exhaust the fuels in their core. Now, normally, stars fuse light elements into heavier ones. They start fusing hydrogen to helium, helium into carbon, and so forth. Eventually, they reach a point where the, uh, the, uh, the core is full of iron, and the star tries to fuse iron. The problem is, when you're fusing light elements, you have an, what can be described as an exothermic reaction. Energy comes up. If you try fusing iron, it tends to be endothermic. It absorbs energy. And when energy is absorbed, all of a sudden, the core shrinks. Now, the core is supporting the topmost section of the, of the star. Not supporting, physically supporting, but the energy from the core is what's supporting the entire star. Once that energy is removed, the core shrinks. The topmost section of the core of the star is unsupported and it collapses into the core itself. The infoli material, it compresses and ignites into what we call a supernova. Now the, the ignition happens where the core is, so which means a good section of the star itself, star matter, is expelled upwards, and that's what we see as supernova. But the compression squeezes the core itself, and because the compression is so high that the matter in the supernova's core disappears, but gravity remains. The problem with this is that matter can be created or destroyed, and gravity can't exist without matter. So let's take a look how uh, the idea of space-time density play into it. Remember when the phase change created matter in the beginning of the universe using the density of space, time itself, space itself, and energy? Well, the supernova explosion, the compression from the supernova explosion dissolves the atoms in the core back into actions and release the energy that was stored inside the atoms. Now that energy cannot be seen by us because we can't see inside a black hole. And not only that, our physics breaks down when described in black holes, but we do believe that the interior of black holes is extremely hot and extremely dense, which is almost back to creating a mini Big Bang. If you move away from the center of the black hole, there's a point called the event horizon. Now, the event horizon is almost like a shell, not a solid shell, not a liquid or gaseous shell. It's a shell, it's the edge where the density inside the black hole is equal to the density on the outside of the black hole. And at the borderline of where this single event horizon is, because of the density, it allows the creation of particles, antiparticles. 
you go outside the event horizon, that's where our universe begins. So basically, what we call a black hole is a density, a space-time density gradient. And the density from the center outwards decreases at 1 over r squared. Now we're going to have a small optics lesson. When light goes from a low density material into a more dense material, it slows down and bends toward the normal. When it goes from a higher density medium into a lower density medium, right on the surface, it bends away from the normal and speeds up at the same time. So basically what we have is light going from air to let's say glass, could be water or anything else. It bends toward the normal, normal being this part here, this line, imaginary line here. It bends toward the normal and then when it comes out, it speeds up and bends away from the normal. So if you look at it, it basically goes in a straight line, but it's offset by a certain amount depending on the density of the material, the, the index of refraction of the material itself. If light hits a denser medium, glass for example, perpendicular to the surface of the glass, then what happens is when it gets to this point here, it slows down goes right through our slower speed. And when it gets to this point here, it speeds up again. But it's a straight line. If somehow the glass could be made into a, co a curve, into a, a round object, a toroid kind of like, and somehow we could inject light into it, which could be done with the, basically using fiber optics, then what would happen is light comes in, slows down, stays slow and keeps going in circles at a slower speed constantly. This will come in handy later. If the sides of the glass are curved, basically a lens, then what happens is the light that impinges, that hits it, it bends toward the normal. When it hits the other edge, it bends again away from the normal, which in this case, it bends this way. It doesn't show it here. And what happens is the light comes in, bends, and meets at what's called the focal point. And whatever is making that light, be it the sun, the light bulb, or whatever it is, it will create a real image at this point here, at the focal point. This is basically Snell's law. Well, there are three places where space-time density creates a behavior in matter or energy that's similar to the optic lesson above it. And the first place is what we call gravitational lensing, or Einstein rings. Light approaching a black hole feels the higher density space and bends, like in Snell's law. And this bending will create real image of objects that are behind the black hole. So we see in Einstein's ring here, because the density of space in the vicinity of black hole, whatever the distance is, is denser. This was noticed way back in 1999. It was measured by Dyson and Eddington during World War I, actually. It turns out there was a, uh, an uh, eclipse the moon came between the sun and the earth. And because of that, they were able to measure where a star appeared to be. Then they went back and measured what, and tried to determine where it's supposed to have been. And it was supposed to have been, let's say, at this point here. So light traveling a straight line approaches the, the sun where the density is higher, bends and hits the earth. So we see that's coming from here. Another concept is eccentricity and precession of planets. Planets do not follow perfectly circular orbits. Now, Mercury, apart from being the closest to the sun, it's the most elliptical orbit. It's the most elliptical, it has the most elliptical orbit. Now, at perihelion, the point where Mercury is the closest to the sun, and it's shown as a dot here, 
okay. Uh, astronomers, astronomers noticed that it didn't go back to the same point like Newton said. Anything in orbit should follow the same path over and over again. It didn't. It seemed like at one point it was here and it moved here and here. The point closest to the sun kept moving. And Newtonian mechanics couldn't explain it. Relativity was able to mathematically explain why the perihelion, a perihelion, the, uh, the, the, the Mercury seemed to move. The point where Mercury was closer to the sun seemed to move. Okay. However, a problem came up with this. Venus precession was measured as 2.04. Using relativity, it came out to being 10.75. So it, if you look at this graph, here's Mercury. It lines up the, the measured precession matches perfectly with relativity. Here's the Earth. It matches perfectly. Here's Mars, close enough. Here's Jupiter, close enough, and so forth. But it turns out, even though relativity predicted all of these meeting points where the, uh, the precession was exactly what it was supposed to be, it didn't work for Venus. Venus, it turned out, for the same numbers, will give you different precession. Well, scientists figure it's because Venus orbit is very nearly circular, and that's why we're having this problem here. Well, as I said before, the extremes are where you notice oddity. Venus is almost a circular orbit. Eccentricity is 0.007. It's perfectly circle. Neptune also has a very low eccentricity of 0.009, almost the same. So the eccentricity is very, very similar, but the precession is not. Neptune's observed precession is 0.036. Using relativity, calculator 0.065, which is close enough. But when it comes to Venus, the precession is measured as 2.04, but when you calculate it, it's 10.75. So relativity has a problem in here. The question is, why is there such a problem? Because of its orbit, in terms of density, because of its orbit and the higher space density around the sun, at perihelion, Mercury slows down and changes direction slightly, just like light did when it went through different density medium. Okay. As it comes out from a, a more dense space to a less dense space, it changes back to the same speed and the same direction, but it's off. And you may notice now I'm talking about space, not space-time. Venus has an almost circular orbit. And in terms of density, the space density is high, but it's almost constant. So it has a low precession. In Neptune's, it also has a circular orbit, but the space density is low as compared to high. But again, it's almost constant, and so it has a low precession. Now, relativity does not account for density, therefore it comes up with an error for Venus and Neptune. So, if the density is what's affecting it, just like light being into a toroidal shape, then what's happening is that somehow Venus travels at a slower speed than is predicted. And the third place where density makes, may make a difference is in, we're looking at stars orbiting the center of, the, of a galaxy, the Milky Way or whatever. Okay. There are two lines here. You notice two lines here. This line is what we expect from the visible disk. This is what we actually get, and it's different. And what's happening here is the stars are orbiting the black hole, let's say. They feel the gravity from the black hole, and they have a certain speed around it. 
if you're going outside of, uh, away from the black hole, then the stars orbiting in this region, orbiting in this region, if you have not only the black hole, but whatever stars are in between, so they're going faster and faster. And the further you go within the bulge, the further you go from the center, the faster the stars go, which is what you're seeing here and here. The problem is when you go into the arms, most of the mass is concentrated in the bulk. So we could almost ignore the mass that's in the arms itself. So what happens is the stars in the arms feel the, the, the gravity from the bulge, but they're far away from it, which means they should be going slower and slower and slower. This is what we expect. The further you are from the bulge, the slower you should be going. Well, it turns out that what's happening is as you move away from the bulge, they speed up. But once you're out of the bulge, that velocity decreases, but it's still there. Why? Well, the reason that I'm see as I'm seeing it is that stars inside the galactic bulge move slower than they're supposed to because of a higher density. But as you move away from the bulge, the density decreases, which means now stars can move faster. So you have the velocity of star giving us a, 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 the, the, the density of, of the, uh, the galaxy, the, the gravity of the galaxy, giving us decreasing, giving us a faster velocity for the stars outside from the bulge. So stars in the galaxy's arm experience less density, therefore they move faster than anticipated. So if you look at this curve here, sorry, if you look at this curve here, the, the galaxy rotation curve, it's basically a density graph that tells us as you move away from the center of the galaxy, the density of the axion, the density of space decreases. We'll see this graph again. Now, when you have, whenever you have objects that are colliding, there's energy being exchanged between the object themselves. So when orbiting object lose, they collide with something else, they end up losing energy, they will slow down and their orbit will decay. Now, planets going through denser regions of action slow down, but just like light, they do not lose energy. Their orbit shape is changed, they precess. And when they come out from the denser region, they return back to original orbit. Again, no different from light. Question becomes, why don't they lose energy? Well, if you think about it, hurricanes, they go from one place to another, but they don't really plow through the air. So they don't lose energy as they move. Similarly, planets going through space-time don't collide with action. So you cannot create, an, you cannot have an experiment that can detect collision between matter and what's being called dark matter. In my next presentation, we'll explore how this density affects the progression of time and a different interpretation of gravity.